There's so many agents and, and workflows and automations that, that I want for myself, but I would never spend the time or I, I don't have the time to build them out. But with Agent Builder, I can spend a minute to describe what I want and then instantly get an agent that, that can run for me. At Langchain, we've historically focused on developer tools. That's what we're known for. And so that's why it's pretty exciting to be here today talking about something different out of our wheelhouse, a, a, a no-code agent builder. And so in this conversation, we're going to kind of like walk through why we built it, some of the features of it, and, and go into all that detail. My name is Harrison. I'm the co-founder CEO, joined here by Brace and Sam, who led a lot of this development effort. So do you guys want to introduce yourselves quickly? Yeah, um, my name is Brace. I lead the Applied AI team at Langchain. Historically, that's meant internal agents and workflows. Uh, but now we're starting to work on this no-code platform uh, to power the enterprise. I'm Sam. I'm a product manager at Langchain. I work on Langgraph platform, which is our deployment platform and runtime for agents, but also working on new efforts around agent security and no-code. All right. So as said, historically, we've focused on building more pro-code tools for technical developers. Why did we decide to create this no-code agent builder? Yeah, like, like you said, that's the history of the company, a, a pretty long history of, of building technical... Three years, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, technical tools for technical people uh, to build agents in production. Uh, but we, we found sort of a common set of, of patterns emerge over time. And we find that those patterns can basically be distilled into agentic architectures. And once you have actually the agentic architecture defined, you can easily allow non-technical people to build new agents via configuration on top of those architectures. And so that looks like taking an architecture like Deep Agents, which this, this is built on, and adding your own tools, adding your own auth, adding your own system prompt, uh, and you make it really easy to build a flexible and powerful agent. Since you mentioned kind of like the architecture and Deep Agents, like what is Deep Agents? What is this architecture that we're building on top of? Uh, I think Deep Agents at a high level is what we've seen in many uh, popular autonomous agents, right? So Cloud Code, Manus, Codex, uh, they're basically React agents, right? Tools and system prompts. Um, but with a slight spin where we give it uh, this like sub agents concept, which itself is just tools and system prompts. Uh, so we can delegate off uh, long running tasks to these sub agents. They can go manage, do their research, and then provide a concise response to the parent agent. And then we also give it tools for to do lists and file system. So file system is used for memory. Uh, we see in like Claude code, it uses the file system. These models are clearly being tuned to uh, work well with the file system. And the same with to-do lists. Um, if you provide you know, these, these agents a structure for the tasks it should execute, uh, in our case, this to-do list tool, um, they tend to do better and follow that structure. Awesome. So we've got this core kind of like agent architecture, which we now think people can build on top of in a, in a no-code way. There's a bunch of different ways to do no-code. How did you guys think about the UI UX for this particular no-code product? Yeah, I think it does come down to the Deep Agents package. There, there's different ways to approach it. Like you said, there are more like workflow builder type solutions that are more deterministic and they have a de defined flow. And, and that is very powerful for building exactly the flow that you want. But a lot of times agents in production need to be able to react on the fly to new information. And Deep Agents is basically just like we're describing a sort of a, a loop with these tools, uh, taking in information, having a system prompt. And so that very flexible architecture allows sort of two things, the agents to be more powerful in prod because it can respond to new info on the fly, but also it's super easy to build because all you have to do effectively is say, sort of what tools do I want? What sub agents do I want optionally? And what instructions should I give the agent? Yeah, I think that's kind of what we want to emphasize here is, is you know, we've been building agents for the last, what, three years. Um, we've seen everything from the you know, most trivial React agents, which are just tools and prompts to like highly complex multi-agent systems. Um, and that's what's led us to deep agents is this accumulation of everything from the simplest agents to the most complex. Um, and we've managed to put them in this deep agent package. And we think that it's going to be really easy for anyone with no technical experience to build agents because um, this really powerful architecture, which is deep agents, um, under the hood is actually fairly simple, right? It's just tools and prompts, but then specialized tools and prompts. Um, yeah. So, so this is like a pretty simple, you described it as a configuration file, and it could just be like a string and, and, and a list of tools. But, but there's more than that in the UI UX. Like there was that kind of like way of chatting to create in a, like why that? Like you could just have like a Google form, right? And have someone like fill that out, but it's not that. Like wh why? Yeah, I think the big thing here is, is most people don't know how to prompt well, right? Even people who are technical are not great prompters. I'm not a great prompter. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, you know, we all struggle with prompting and they're also just tedious to write. You know, like look at cl cl the Claude Code prompt. It's 
what, 10,000 tokens long. So nobody wants to write a full prompt. Um, and what we found is, is we, we can have, we can, you know, uh, abstract that away to the LLM so that what the user does is they just provide a natural language description of their agent. And then an LLM does all the busy work of writing out the system prompt, picking what tools to use, deciding if it needs a sub agent or not. Um, and, you know, just using natural language to do all this makes it much easier on both the non-technical user and the technical user. I think an interesting part here as well, talking about like prompts and building prompts, it's a very iterative process. Um, how, it, it, and, and here you've kind of got a platform where you both build the agents and use the agents. And there's kind of like some interesting, uh, you know, like you might want to iterate on it in both scenarios. Like you might be using it and then want to iterate on it. You might be like building it and the, the first meta prompt comes out incorrect and you might want to iterate on it. Like how, like, how did you guys think about that? And, and what are some still open questions there if there are any? Yeah, that was clearly very obvious from the get-go is both paradigms are important. Sort of the paradigm of initial creation, allowing them to use natural language, making it very obvious how they can do that, uh, but also updating the agent over time. Um, in terms of interacting with the agent, chat is, is something that people have gotten very used to with, with products like ChatGPT becoming, becoming pretty ubiquitous. And so uh, the main way to in initially test your agent, as we saw in the demo, is to just chat at it and see how it responds, see what tools it calls. Then you as the human user can very easily understand what is it doing. Uh, you, you can see that and you can start to think, you know, what maybe in the instructions would allow it to improve what it's doing and, and follow a better path. And then you can easily update that in the editor that we've created. This is maybe a little bit philosophical, but like prompt instructions, memory, are these the same thing? It's a good question. Um, we've been debating as to whether or not we should have the system prompt be stored in memory um, and kind of have it work like DSPy, where it's constantly updating its own system prompt. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's something we're experimenting with, whether it should be a hard-coded prompt that's only changed when the user explicitly tells it to, or if the agent should be able to, you know, constantly update its own prompt on the fly based on whatever feedback it gets from the user. What, I mean, what, what do you think? Uh, sort of prompt versus memory, how do you think about the intersection? I don't know if I have a super strong take right now. I think, uh, I think one really interesting way to view memory is just like as a file system. And I think a prompt is a file. And so I think that makes it very, very natural to put in there. I think you know, memory, you can also think of more complex data structures that go beyond a prompt. I think there's also, uh, if we think about sharing agents, right? Like if I, if I create an agent and share it, I think there is, if, if I update the base instructions, I probably want that to be reflected with the agent I share with you. But if you interact with the agent or I interact with the agent and it starts to remember things that are different than the base instructions, those probably shouldn't be shared, right? So I do think there is some difference. I don't 100% know like yet yeah, like what that means technically or, or what the barrier exactly is. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I think, it's, I think that's probably one of the more interesting things to, to figure out. Speaking of like figuring things out, this is a new kind of like platform for building agents. A new set of agents are being built on top of it. What have you learned about how people want to use their agents once they've built it? Yeah, I mean, part of how we've developed this product so far is by dog booting it within Langchain pretty extensively. Uh, so we have, as of today, almost almost 100 agents running on this platform used by the employees at our company. Um, to, to start, most people want to do pretty simple things. They want an assistant for their email inbox. They want an assistant for some Slack channel that they ha commonly have to use. Um, so a lot of them in, in the early days look sort of like simple productivity type assistants. Over time, even though it's a new product, we're starting to see more complex sort of like multi-turn agents being brought to production, but also agents that take action, that send, send messages, that send emails, that create linear tickets or labels or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think that you know the, the most common way people want to interact with these agents is through chat. But then there's also instances where people don't want to interact with their agent. They want to create their agent, set up some sort of autonomous trigger, right? When you get a new email or a Slack message and have it run for them in the background. So we have both, right? We have chat where you can go and if you have a question you ask your agent, you send it. Uh, but then it can also just run for you in the background. And that way, you, know, you create your agent once and then, you know, maybe you check your inbox once a day or you get a Slack DM and the agent is always active and running for you in the background. So, okay. So on, on that note, you mentioned triggers. That's the new thing that's new, new in this platform. Like what are triggers? Why did we introduce them? What are some use cases? And then kind of related to that. And with this idea of kind of like balancing autonomy with like human oversight, there are a bunch of tools that require, there's this human in the loop aspect to a lot of these tools, like requiring approval, editing. Can you talk about 
why we have that and how that balances also with some of these triggers and, and all of this like interaction between autonomy and running in the background, but also still having the human in the loop and, and how to balance all of that. Yeah, we have found that some people do just want agents that they can chat to, like ChatGPT, but more often than not, people are starting to want ambient agents, which is a concept we've been talking about for a few months now, sort of these agents that run in the background. And are those are those like workflows, basically, that they're trying to automate? Like, is that a way to think about it, or are they more broad even? I think a lot of the time they are workflows. They are sort of, you know, receive email, see if you want to ignore it via a mark, Gmail mark as red tool or respond to it. Um, but a lot of the times they are something that should just sort of like run daily you know pull in a bunch of information from various sources and then decide how to act and the actions that it will take will be different each time so i think it's sort of a combination of workflows but also something much more flexible than that yeah i think we have workflows and that's going to be the most common you know task that people implement like read my emails and then decide if you, you should respond or not um, but because deep agents is so good at handling these simple tasks right like reading and responding to emails um, but because they have this sub agents concept, right, this like worker concept where you can send the more complex tasks off to have it handle that and then return with this concise response. They're also really good at handling um, like agentic tasks, right, where you get an email and maybe it responds or maybe it goes and does research and then responds. And deep agents allows you to do the, this wide range of tasks all within like the same simple. agent. Well, OK, so that's an interesting point. Sub agents. When should I use them? Yeah, I think sub agents are best utilized when you have a long running or context intensive task, right? So research where it needs to go and search over five, 10, 100 different websites, that's going to be a lot of tokens. You don't necessarily need the parent agent to know about every single one of those web pages. So instead, you delegate it off to a sub agent, it goes it, it reads the million different tokens from all these different websites, generates a concise report with all the answers that the parent agent asks, and then the parent agent only sees that final report with the answers it cares about. And it doesn't need to see any of those um, intermediate steps that led to the final reports. And I, I think the fact that you asked that question is important too. Like when to use sub agents, most people don't know how to answer that. Yeah. Even, as for myself, like I have no idea in a lot of cases, you know, when to use a sub agent. And so I think that's also, that speaks to the agent creation and the agent editor flow that we've created where I just have to describe the task effectively. And our agent creator agent is, is the one that can decide, you know, that this might require a lot of search. And so like we should split out this part of the task into a sub agent and over time, uh, the product will also get better at that. We've talked, uh, we've mentioned a few times kind of like human in the loop and autonomy and that type of things. There, there are like these human, in the, like taking actions is scary and can be scary sometimes. And so there are these human in the loop controls on some of the tools. Can you guys just talk about like what those are and then how you interact with, with these things? In the agent builder, we have this concept of interrupts, which is something we were able to, to take from LangGraph, where um, the agent can essentially propose an action it wants to take. Say it's the send email uh, tool. You don't necessarily want your agent to just send an email on your behalf without you reading over what it's going to send. Uh, so in the agent builder, we have a way for you to mark a tool as a tool that requires an interrupt. Uh, and how that works is the agent will then call that tool, right? It, it, and it can see the tool from the agent's perspective. There's no such thing as an interrupt. It thinks it can just call it and it'll execute. So it calls the tool. It proposes some input if it's the send email, say it's you know a, a subject and a body. Um, but then before actually executing that action, right, sending the actual email, the agent will pause and it'll give you the opportunity to read over and review the action it's trying to take. You can modify it. You can send a response to the agent and ask it to change it in some way. Um, so we're we're allowing the agent to take these so-called like destructive actions, but first requiring your approval uh, and giving you the opportunity to edit or or change that before it actually sets. What, what does that look like for it to give me the, the ability to control it or edit? And like, what if it's kicked off in the background by one of these triggers that we've talked about? Yeah, that's why we've built part of the product is, is sort of an agent inbox. It's, it's a, a view of all conversations from this agent. And many of those conversations are, are done and have been fully processed. There's, there's no action to take, but many of them have been interrupted. And so you as the user of the agent can just easily filter through your agent inbox, see which ones need you to take action and quickly go through each of those. And uh, we've sort of embedded, as we saw in the demo, um, that interrupt flow into the actual chat experience. And that's a, a pretty natural way to give it feedback. Uh, so you can easily go through and, and take action quickly on all of them. Exactly. Yeah, we've kind of borrowed this concept from an email inbox where you know you, you receive the, these emails, you can you can go through, or in our case, threads or conversations, you can go through and look at past threads. Uh, you can see which ones require your, your attention, require actions for you to take, right? These interrupted tools. Um, and then you can you know, go and chat with the agent, uh, resolve the interrupts, um, and manage it all through like a very familiar concept to all of us who have used email before. Um, a few points you mentioned LangGraph, which is obviously a developer framework. 
can I take these agents and run them in Langraph? Yeah, um, agents that you build in, in the agent creator under the hood are just Langraph assistants. Um, and the, the agent that powers the agent builder is just an instance of the deep agents architecture. So any agent you create in the agent builder, um, you can very trivially take the configuration which defines that agent and go and create a new assistant in a separate production deployment. So you can use the agent builder to prototype or iterate on uh, agents you might want to take to production afterwards. And then once you're happy with it and you use this, this agent builder UX to iterate on it, you can take that configuration, go and create a new assistant in your production deployment. And that's all it takes to take an agent from agent builder to uh, production. And it's also why in the, in the early days of this product, we want to make it really easy to get started. So we're hosting the deep agent for all of our users that use this product in the cloud. But over time, we'll allow you to bring your own deep agent. We'll allow you to host some other kind of graph architecture and, and use that graph to power uh, new assistants via non-technical users as well. A lot of technical concepts here. Uh, you know, we've talked about tools, integrations, auth, let, let, like putting even aside kind of like, you know, LangGraph and some of the developer frameworks. How, how, how do you think about making all of these things accessible to a different audience than we've approached in the past? I think you have to just totally break down your mental framing of the product. I, I found that like as a technical person myself, I'm I'm often coming up with frankly the wrong ideas for this product because I'm I'm designing it in a way that I want it to be designed. And, and we, we can talk as well. I think there is an interesting aspect of this product that it, it does make it easier for technical people to build agents as well, but we, we are primarily purposing it for those non-technical people. And that's sort of how we came to this core UX of like using natural language to create the agent, having a a very friendly looking doc based editor to edit it and so forth. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the, the biggest thing is just we, we don't want to force people to go through the tool list and pick that uh, right out the system prompt. Um, so we're, we're really centering all around these these agents that work in the background for you or you can chat with that that can build this agent for you. Um, and Sam brought up a good point uh, where like, like, yes, this is a non technical uh, application where you don't need to know how to code or like really how LLMs work to use it. Um, but that being said, it's also really useful for technical people, right? There's so many agents and, and workflows and automations that, that I want for myself, but I would never spend the time or I, I don't have the time to build them out. Uh, but with Agent Builder, I can spend a minute to describe what I want and then instantly get an agent that, that can run for me. So like, yes, it's going to um, you know, help with, with the non-technical uh, users to automate some tasks, but then also for technical users, you know, we have so many ideas for things we want to build, but we would never build them if we had to write it all out in code. And I mean, like writing the prompts is really hard. So yeah, thank you for building something where I don't have to write prompts. Um, maybe maybe one uh, kind of like, you know, interesting slash hot take question to kind of end it. Like, uh, you know, th this is a new thing that we're going into. I think there's a, there's a lot of really cool ideas that I think we've put in here. What is one area where you actually feel like we don't have the right answer for necessarily yet? And you'd love kind of like feedback from users as they use it in, in that direction. I think we've built the products to be very modular, like, you know, bring your own tools, uh, use your own auth, eventually bring your own triggers. T today, it's we, we want sort of like a very easy onboarding experience, so we're providing all of that for you. I'm really excited to get this out in people's hands and see sort of like what tools they want to be added, um, which, which we can add for them, but also like what sort of experience do they want their core platform team to have to, to add new tools themselves, to add new triggers themselves. Uh, also that the non-technical user, by the time that they show up in the product for the first time, all the modules are in place for them already. Yeah, I think for me that there's like two main areas which, which are still kind of an unknown. The first is like how you optimize the agent. So initially when you go to Agent Builder, you give it a description, answer some follow-ups, and we give you this initial version. Um, but then what is the, the best way to improve that agent afterwards? Is it a chat, uh, like a, a chatbot agent, which can go and modify your prompt? Is it similar to like a Canvas experience where you highlight some text in the system prompt and give feedback? Um, is it totally different where you just chat with the agent and then can like give a thumbs up or thumbs down on a message and then we have some autonomous system figure out what your intent is. Um, so like, for, for me, that, that's still kind of a big unknown and like we have ideas there, um, but the only way we're going to really figure out what, what the best experience is, is is by getting feedback from everyone who uses it and seeing what works and what doesn't work for them. Cool. Well, I, I think this is a great call to action. We'd definitely love people to, to try it out. I think this is one of the cooler, more interesting things that we've done. So. Uh, yeah, kudos to, to you guys for a great ship and thanks for walking us all through it. Thank, Thank you. you.